Hey everyone, I'm here to talk about Help Desk Identity and Access Management. The best practices for Help Desk Identity and Access Management are covered here, so I'm going to go through the top 10 of what I think is the top 10 for IAM as abbreviated. So number one is a Identity and Access Management process. So a lot of a lot of companies don't formally document their IAM process. When you're working at the help desk, a lot of analysts, they work step by step. They look at a process or procedure and they, they follow it. You want them to follow uh, the same process each time so it's repeatable. Once you have that in place, good or bad, you can review it and when you need to make changes, you can use the change management process and, and update and improve it. So even if you don't have a really detailed process, it's good to start somewhere. Document what you have, then you can find out the gaps that you're missing, and you can work on that and add that process. Okay, so you have your IAM process documented. You had your security team review it. All the steps are correct. It's perfect. Now what? Well, our second best practice is help desk training. You want to train your agents how to use that process. Uh, you don't want them skipping steps or kind of doing what they think the process should be. You want them to follow the documented process. You also want to provide training so you answer any of their questions. Why are we doing this? What's the benefit of it? So they really get on board with it because security is something you don't want to mess around with. You want to make sure that the, everyone is knowledgeable about it and they've been trained. Also, if there's any corrective action down the road, you want to make sure that you have a documented uh, um, date and uh, time where you train the individual. They know the steps. They were aware of them. If they didn't follow them, uh, there could be correct, corrective action up into termination. So you want to make sure that all that was documented and uh, provided. And finally, that if there's any changes or improvements or new steps or new process that's documented and in your procedure, you want to make sure that you train everyone on that new stuff. You want to make sure that not only do they get the original training of the, of the overall policy, but they have to get reoccurring training of anything that's new or changed. And just uh, also just to keep them up to speed so uh, you never know. Also they can get in some bad habits and you want to break them of that and make sure they follow the process. So that's our number two best practice is help desk training. The third best practice for user identity and access management is identifying the users or validating them when they call. When your help desk answers a call and there's a caller on the line, you establish their identity before resetting their password or doing any work for them. Especially uh, if it's security work like account management or anything to do with their account or password. In the past, the help desk worked with the user to have prearranged challenge questions. That would be something that they know. In the past that worked all right, but now uh, compromised user accounts are one of the primary culprits of uh, major data breaches. Uh, companies are moving away from just challenge questions. What they're looking for is uh, multi-factors. So they're looking for the user to provide something they have, which is a token or a phone code or a security app, and a code can be sent to them, or there's uh, uh, systems that use that for establishing user identities. Or there's something that they are, which is like a fingerprint or a face scan uh, using like Microsoft Hello and other things. While establishing a user identity may sound difficult, there's a lot of applications and systems out there that will really help you get something set up. So there's uh, identity and access management systems that uh, built right in that help you establish the user identity and collect that information so your help desk can make informed decisions. So that's number three, user identification validation. So the fourth identity and access management best practice is implement self-service password management. Self-service password management is one of the best things that you can do for a help desk. Do your customers have the ability to reset their passwords using a self-service tool? They should have, whether they go to your portal or some other place, it is more secure 
It is cost effective and you'll reduce the overall budget of your help desk. One reason the help desk managers love this is it reduces the high call volume on certain days like Monday mornings or all the uh, different times like during a, a new application rollout after holidays when users just forget their passwords. And why do they do that? Some of the problem might be the IT and all uh, their requirements. They're making the passwords more complex. That's because user account breaches are the number one ways that uh, companies are being compromised. So what they do is uh, they're instilling or making sure that the uh, user has complex passwords. And then over a three day weekend, like a holiday weekend, the user forgets what that password is. So now they need a reset and they call the help desk. There's a long line of people waiting to get in. If you incorporate self-service password management, all they need to do is go to a portal and you can uh, make sure your requirements for the user to establish their identity when they go in there. Uh, you can actually add a lot of uh, factors to it. Uh, you can have them use multi-factor like an app where they have to uh, receive a code and enter it either on their phone or some secure app on their phone. So it's really more secure, cost effective uh, to use self-service password management. So that's why we call this the fourth best practice of identity and access management. The fifth best practice for identity and access management is separate administrative accounts for your help desk agents. So what does that mean? When your help desk needs elevated permissions to reset passwords or get into a system or such, do they have a separate account they use? Or do they use their primary one that they're using day to day? Best practice is giving the help desk agents a secondary account with elevated permissions. Administrative accounts with uh, these uh, elevated permissions are, easy, are more easy to secure and control. Another option is Many companies are using security applications. These applications uh, will change system passwords uh, either on a regular basis or on demand. So what happens if, if you have a full-time employee, an engineer that leaves a company, um, you can force a, a password change on many systems using uh, these applications or if you have a contractor that leaves or such. And that's important because you don't want your systems compromised by uh, rogue agents or other people that have left the company and um, you know you have that vulnerability out there. Auditing is also very useful. useful. So how many people have accessed this account or this system? Uh, who is it? You know, so doing a weekly or monthly audit is a good practice to make sure that uh, your your secure systems are secure. Um, so the fifth best practice of identity access management is to make sure your agents have a separate administrative account for uh, elevated permissions. Identity and access management best practice number six is onboarding process. Do you have an automated onboarding process to set up permissions for new employees? Most, most mature help desks do. Onboarding new users is a process that occurs repeatedly. You're always onboarding or offboarding or changing user roles. Many help desks expend a lot of energy trying to set up accounts ad hoc. Having an automated onboarding process makes your account set up smooth and repeatable. At the heart of the onboarding process is a workflow engine. This workflow in engine is where you set up the rules of what uh, needs to occur and who needs to approve it and what actions need to be taken. This can be done either in your ticketing application if it allows it or there's third party applications that allow onboarding uh, workflow processing. Identity and access management best practice number seven is role-based access control. Does your company have a defined role-based access control? Does it allow permitting users access to only what they absolutely need to perform their job functions? If not, you should look into role-based access control. 
Employees must only be allowed access to resources necessary to perform their job duties. Role-based access control is a setup to define specific roles in your company. These roles could be something like, let's say, a financial analyst or a human resource generalist. What access do they need to perform their roles? Once the default role is defined, then permissions and security groups are assigned to that role. So when a user is moving into that role, they get rid of all their previous roles and permissions, and they inherit only what is necessary to perform their duties. What you want to do is minimize the chance where uh, issues can be caused by someone with improper uh, levels of access and permissions. So this is the identity and access management best practice number seven, role-based access control. Identity and access management best practice number eight. Does your company have a process to obtain approval from service owners and employee managers for access requests? So we just talked about um, onboarding, but for access requests, um, it's best practice in the industry to not only get your manager to approve the access, but we want the service owner, we want the person that owns that service to approve it. Uh, your manager might or might not know if you should have it. They might just say, well, I guess he needs it or she needs it, so I'll approve it. Not knowing all the ramifications of doing that. So the service owners will know, um, one, should this person have access? And two, is there any uh, specific access they need? Maybe it's a read only to a certain area. Maybe it's edit to a different area. Or maybe it's admin control for the overall entirety of the service. So they'll know if there's any um, levels of permission needed for the service. So that's why best practice is uh, you, you receive approval not only from your manager for access, but the service owners. Um, and then the help desk, they get a lot of requests for the resources, so they don't know uh, necessarily who everyone's manager is or who the service owner is, so that, that is all documented so they can reference it. They need to know uh, the re org chart for the employees, and they need to know also who owns each of the services. And that's for manual ticket escalations or assignments. What you also want to do, as we talked in our previous uh, best practice of uh, onboarding, you want to have a workflow engine. So if someone needs access to, let's say, SAP, and they need um, read-only access or worker access or some level of general, general analyst access, they go in and they select that as the role and the, and the access they need. And the workflow takes that and first goes to the manager and say, do you approve of your employee having this? And if they say yes, then it goes to the service owner and it also says, uh, is this the right um, access for this person and should they ab allow, be allowed to have it? And if they approve it, then it, it gets processed by someone who, who puts that access in. It might be a security group in the, on their AD account. And once that's done, they're notified their access is in place. This can go real, rather quickly, and it's all auditable, which is uh, important. So that's why best practice number eight for identity and access management is the access approval process. Identity and access management best practice number nine, access auditing. Do you have a way of auditing password resets and account provisioning? Most companies do might be somewhat manual, might be automated, but they do have a process uh, to ensure that if uh, um, accounts are reset and access or provision, that they have that documented just for um, auditing purposes. The reason for this is creating user accounts, resetting passwords, delegating access is too easy if left unchecked. The help desk can easily do any one of these in a matter of seconds, if not minutes. The administrative ability to perform these actions need to be restricted, controlled, and monitored. Once you have your processes and, and controls in place, then you want to audit it. 
At a basic level, <clears throat> Active Directory has specific groups, policy settings where you can uh, record or log any of these security actions. The problem is the logging goes into a file that can be extremely difficult to um, review and, and really uh, make some sense out of it. There are many third-party applications that can take these log files and put them into something that's uh, very mean meaningful and uh, makes sense and you can look right at it and you can get data from it so you can extract it, you can run reports, you can get all the data that mined out of there that you need. So that's why best practice number nine for identity and access management is access auditing. That's why it's important. It's, uh, it's definitely something that you need to have in place. Finally, our best practice number 10 for identity and access management is multi-factor authentication. Does your company use multi-factor authentication? Well, you should. Using one information like a password to log into an account can be a security risk. User authentication to a resource by two or more pieces of evidence known as multi-factor authentication is more secure. The evidence or factors are groups into knowledge, possession, and inheritance. To explain this a little bit more, the knowledge means something you know such as a password. The possession is something that only a user has such as a token. Inheritance is something the user is, such as a fingerprint. Combining two or more of these is a multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is used to make uh, access to resources more secure. If one factor, such as a password, is compromised, you still have the second factor, such as a fingerprint or a token, to secure the resource. That's why for identity and access management, our best practice number 10 is multi-factor authentication.